All right, welcome everyone to this online CNA webinar. My name is Jessica Budlong and I'm a research intern with CNA Strategy and Policy Analysis Program. We study issues ranging from maritime security to managing alliances, nuclear policy, and non-traditional security issues. This is a monthly series of Zoom events where we explore various strategy and policy topics. They're recorded and posted to our website, cna.org strategy. In the next hour, my co-panelists and I will discuss diversity in the nuclear policy field. Diversity is a topic that has received a lot of attention over the past year and a half. The Biden administration has one of the most diverse cabinets in history, with more women, people of color, and women of color in high-level government positions. The nuclear space has seen the confirmation of Under Secretary Bonnie Jenkins, Secretary Jennifer Granholm, Principal Deputy Administrator of NSA Frank Rose, and others. Outside of government, we've seen women take leadership roles, including Kim Deal, Director of Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and Emma Belcher, president of Plowshares Fund. Our discussions today will look across the field to see what progress has been made and how we can improve going forward. We're delighted to discuss these issues with Sarah Bidgood from CNS, Vince Manzo from the Department of State, Sylvia Mishra from the European Leadership Network, and Alex Stark from New America. Thanks to you all for being here today. Now each of us is going to provide introductory remarks for a few minutes. I'll start us off in recent challenges facing the field. As I mentioned previously, government leadership positions are becoming more diverse. Yet, according to a 2019 New America report, the consensual street jacket, for the past 49 years, only 12% of leadership positions in the US nuclear policy were held by women and only 2% by women of color. I'm also part of the younger generation looking for opportunities within the nuclear policy space. We see more and more paid internships, but still very few early and mid career positions. There are numerous organizations trying to fill these gaps and make the field more accessible. My own organization, the Nuclear Fusion Project, has tried to increase accessibility. Other organizations such as WCAPS, N Square Lab, Girls Security, Out in National Security, Gender Champions in Nuclear Policy, and so many others are also doing amazing work but there's still a sense of insurmountable barriers for professionals, including the use of jargon, security clearance processes, limited promotion potential, and expected years of experience. Thinking about these dimensions and looking across the field, there are clearly a lot of issues we'll cover today, as well as Q&A from attendees. So first, let me... ...give a brief introduction. Introduction of panelists. First, it's Manza. It looks like we lost our uh, host, but maybe should we wait a minute or two to see if she pops back in before we keep going? Hey, this is Tim here. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties. Um, I don't think that we need to, she'll get back and we'll pick up uh, with her where she left off. Um, if we want to, we can move through a series of, um, of moderated discussion questions that Jessica's prepared for all of our discussion. Um, I have, according to her notes, um, Alex going first. Um, Alex, do you want to kick us off with uh, your views on how the field has changed over the past decade or so? Sure, although I see Jessica's back now. Jessica, do you want to continue or should I get started? Up to you. Jessica, press on. Awesome, what was the last thing you heard from me? A webinar wouldn't be complete without technical issues. I think you, you were about to start introducing the panelists. I'm sorry if, you, if you've made a lot of progress <laughs> once you froze. Awesome. All right, I'll start over. So introducing, giving a brief introduction of the panelists. I'll start with Sarah Bitgood, um, Director of Eurasia Nonproliferation Program um, at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. 
She leads the Young Women in Nonproliferation Initiative at CNS. Next, we have Vince Manzo, the team lead for Treaty Implementation and Compliance in the Office of Strategic Stability and Deterrence Affairs and the Department of State's Bureau of Arms Control, Verification and Compliance. Prior to joining the Department of State, Manzo worked at CNA in the Strategy and Policy Analysis Program. Sylvia Mishra is a new tech uh, nuclear officer at the European Leadership Network and a doctoral researcher at the Department of Defense Studies, King's College, London. She chairs the CBRN Working Group for Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security and is a steering committee member of Org and Solidarity. And finally, Dr. Alex Stark, a senior researcher for the Political Reform Program at New America. She was also a co-author on the report, The Consensual Street Jacket, Four Decades of Women in Nuclear Security. Alex, over to you. Thanks, Jessica. This is um, such an important topic and I'm, I'm really grateful to you and, and the CNA folks for organizing this uh, and, and excited for the opportunity to interact with the rest of these amazing panelists. So. Uh, starting out with thanks. Um, I wanted to talk about the connection between diversity in terms of sort of national security personnel and innovation and policy outcomes. So um, you had framed the event about kind of what has changed in the field. Um, and there's lots that that's changed, of course. But one of the things that, that comes to mind for me is that the, this idea that diversity is critical, um, first, because it's about representation, right? And we should have a policy community that looks like the America that it's supposed to be representing. Um, and that's really important and, and great when, when things trend in the right direction. Um, but um, at the same time as a field, I think we're also increasingly acknowledging that um, diverse policy personnel are important because they are from different communities, different parts of, of America and from the world, and will therefore have different life experiences, different backgrounds, um, knowledge of different types of issues. And we know that this is critical you know, across sectors. So if you look in, in the business world, for example, where this has been studied um, in great detail, there's research that shows um, how diverse companies and di diverse boards make better decisions and they have more profitable companies, which is the outcome that businesses are looking for. Um, and I think this is a particularly important point in the nuclear security world, uh, although of course it's important across national security issues um, because uh, nuclear, so national security itself is pretty, um, I, this is not a word, but undiverse <laughs> compared to other policy areas. Um, but then, when you look at all of the different kind of sub subfields or, or facets of national security, um, I think that nuclear security is one of the most kind of small C conservative fields, the, the one of the ones that takes longer to change. And in part that there's, that's because there's this sense that these issues are really super technical. They're really existential and important. Um, which is true, of course, to an extent, but that also leads to, I think, a lot of gatekeeping. So there's this idea that you have to be kind of the, the elder graybeard who has decades of experience to even be able to weigh in on these, these questions and these issues. Um, and, and that's not to say that experience isn't important, of course it is. Um, but what that means in practice is that communities that uh, have been historically marginalized from the field, including, of course, people of color, uh, women, LGBTQ plus folks and others um, aren't necessarily able to meet that bar of the same, at the same, um, to the same degree of having those several decades of experience in senior roles, right? And of course there are, there are plenty of, of senior folks, but um, what we've seen in the past few years, I think is that, or, or maybe to say what has changed is that bringing people in from different backgrounds, um, different walks of life who have, has, has really started to open up the conversation and to put different issues on the table than we might historically have thought of as like, you know, important or existential um, nuclear security issues um, and to put more innovative policy solutions and ideas on the table. Um, just one example uh, of this conversation that has opened up um, is around uh, nuclear testing and its effects on communities of color. So this is, you know, actually one of the important ways that nuclear weapons really touch and affect the everyday lives of people and communities. 
but wasn't really talked about under that umbrella of you know, nuclear weapons and national security, at least historically. And so um, just to take one example, the, the awesome organization Bomb Shelto, which uses uh, creative storytelling and the arts to kind of convey this idea that nuclear issues aren't just this abstract thing that exists over there, but something that does really affect folks' lives. Um, they worked in collaboration with the Navajo Nation to create um, a histories project, which looks at the history of U.S. government uranium mining on land that belongs to indigenous communities historically and how um, that legacy has kind of impacted communities today. So just to end my, my kind of intro remarks on, on an optimistic note, um, I, I'm sure we have a long way to go. And I haven't looked at the recent numbers for that you mentioned for the consensual straitjacket report. It would be interesting to see how things have changed in this administration. Um, but at the same time, I'm really encouraged by, by this progress that we've made so far, and especially by the leadership of folks uh, like Jessica and others um, who have really carried the charge forward on this issue. Um, and I'm really grateful to be part of the conversation. So thanks. Great, thank you. Sylvia? Thank you so much, Jessica. My compliments to you and CNA for hosting this very important and timely and also very necessary conversation. Nuclear policy issues are complex. Uh, the challenges, it affects ramifications and mitigation strategies invites deeper thinking, creative approaches and demands a variety of perspectives. And therefore it is important to be intentional about being gender inclusive and to promote diversity, but just not of gender, but also of thoughts of backgrounds, of experiences, age in the field. The nuclear policy field is changing. It is at an inflection point and several factors like a renewed focus on geopolitical rivalries, the rapid pace of emerging technologies, its integration with strategic weapons, waning arms control efforts and treaties, the threat of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and the weakening of norms and taboos, they all collectively, individually, and separately are contributing to distinct shifts that we are seeing in the nuclear policy landscape. One critical, but mostly an overlooked and understudied component of systemic racism is the racial injustices that has been a part of the strategic nuclear policy community. And that is why it is important for us to delve deeper on questions of diversity, of questions of equity and inclusion in the nuclear policy field. Where does this field stand with respect to representation, culture? Where are we headed from here on? And how can the nuclear policy field address this lack of diversity and inclusion? And what are some of the steps that can be taken to grow and diversify the talent pipeline in the field? One of the questions that is also important for us to remember is the importance of non-proliferation and disarmament education in the field. And along with that, how important is mentorship and advocacy to nourish talent that can also help diversify and make the field much more vibrant. So as and how we see in the past 18 months, the world is adapting uh, to newer technologies, newer changes. So we need to also ask ourselves, are there some of the lessons that can be learned during this pandemic to be more inclusive and to be part of a new normal? As I conclude, I want to highlight a, an important data that uh, women of color advancing peace and um, security, I co-chaired the CBRN uh, working group at WCAPS. And as a part of our reporting to the gender champions in the nuclear policy field, we have underscored that in the past 18 months, almost two years, we have matched 262 men, men, mentees to mentors. And all of the 131 mentees are women of color. And uh, also there are men uh, who we consider an important part of the process and our allies are mentoring these uh, young women. I look forward to having a more uh, uh, engaging conversation and to the Q&A. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, Sylvia. Thanks.
Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jessica and, and CNA for, for organizing uh, this panel and for inviting me to speak on it. I'm, I'm very grateful to be here um, with, with my uh, excellent panelists to talk about this issue. Also just say that it's, it's nice to, to virtually be back at uh, CNA, which was a, a very good home to me for, for a couple of years, uh, an excellent organization. So I'm gonna uh, draw from my professional experiences in the US government and in the policy focused uh, research community. Um, but my, my remarks today are, are my own views and, and do not necessarily reflect uh, the views of the US government. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just focus uh, on the question of, of what has changed in the nuclear policy field over the, the last 10, uh, to 12 years, which is when I entered it, um, and, and what hasn't changed. So just to, to give you some context, my, my first job in the, in the nuclear policy field was back in 2009 at the National Defense University. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a, a great mentor, uh, Elaine Bunn, who gave me a, a lot of uh, amazing opportunities um, and was always willing to share her, her deep expertise and experiences uh, with me. She would also take my views seriously. And, and, and by that, I mean, she would both listen to, to what I had to say uh, about a particular issue, um, but also provide plenty of uh, constructive scrutiny. So uh, letting me know when issues were, were more complex than I realized, uh, when the logic in an argument had a, had a weak point, when writing wasn't as clear as it, as it could be, um, or when my understanding of the facts of an issue was simply incomplete. Um, and I think that that type of mentorship is very important, and it's something I try and uh, try and emulate uh, with, with my younger colleagues that I'm uh, fortunate enough to work with. Um, I also learned uh, from Elaine that it, it is really important to remember that that nuclear policy, as much as, as it's about uh, strategic concepts and theories and technology and military operations and diplomacy, um, it's also about how people interact with each other, um, how they understand each other, and how they often misunderstand each other. Um, and so as, as uh, one of my, my colleagues noted, it's, it's not just an abstract thing. Um, it really is about people. Uh, when, I, when I entered the field, I also participated in the, the CSIS project on, on nuclear issues, or PONY, as, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, which was and I think continues to be a forum that creates uh, learning and networking opportunities for, for younger and mid-career professionals. Um, I was also uh, participated in the Pacific Forum Young Leaders Program, which is how I attended my first uh, US-China TRAP 1.5 dialogue on nuclear strategy. Uh, one thing that always impressed me about these programs is they did take a, a, a big tent approach, um, valuing both uh, intellectual and experiential diversity. Um, they didn't, in, in my view, uh, prioritize any particular policy perspective. They were really trying to bring in as many people as, as they could. Uh, and through these, these programs, I met a, many other young professionals such as myself at the time, uh, mid-career folks and, and more senior experts, many of whom I'm still in touch with today. And I was always struck by how engaging uh, the senior experts were and how invested they were in creating opportunities for the next generation of scholars and practitioners. Now, I think one reason uh, that you had both individuals and institutions who were uh, committed to sort of building genera uh, generational diversity is, is the recognition of that there was a problem, um, that, that the field wasn't as, as diverse as it needed to be. Um, and, and certainly that uh, the majority of folks in the nuclear policy space uh, were, were near in retirement age, but the problems, uh, the, the nuclear security challenges that, that we uh, must deal with were going to persist. Um, uh, and so that was something they wanted to, uh, to remedy. I think there really was a serious uh, effort in the field to help new professionals get their feet in the door and build expertise. And I think many of these senior experts that I encountered uh, also saw value in making room for a, a new cadre of uh, scholars and practitioners who would bring a fresh set of eyes and experiences to nuclear policy issues. So they were trying to, to uh, bring in folks whose formative experiences weren't during the Cold War. So I was struck by how much attention there was to, in the nuclear policy field to, to remedying uh, what many people identified was that was clearly a lack of, of diversity. So that was, was 10 to 12 years ago, uh, what has changed? In my view, I think we're now much more explicit, both as individuals and, and organizations about uh, our responsibility to improve all dimensions of diversity. So gender, race, age, uh, economic background, as well as uh, intellectual and professional backgrounds. Um, now, I, I certainly believe that, that actions always speak uh, 
louder than words uh, on, on this set of issues, but I think sometimes to spur action, it is important to be explicit about our values and, and responsibilities. So I think this is a, a positive development that we're, we're seeing in the field. Uh, at the Department of State, for instance, um, Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, Bonnie Jenkins, and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control Verification and Compliance, Alex Bell, have, have both stressed that a more diverse and inclusive workforce in the nuclear policy field and in national security more broadly is one that is likely to be more effective as well uh, for, for many of the reasons I think uh, Alex laid out in her remarks um, and also, um, you know, not least of which, I think we're more likely to recruit hardworking, talented people if we're drawing from the entire population and not just a, a narrow segment. I think that's very important. Um, and I would also just recommend to you all that uh, uh, Under Secretary Jenkins, Jenkins delivered remarks uh, to the uh, Conference on Disarmament on August 26th on uh, uh, women's participation and role in international security that I would, I would recommend that you all uh, check out when you have a moment. So I, I think the prioritization of, of diversity uh, is both a continuation and an evolution of what, uh, what I encountered back in, in 2009 when I entered the field. Um, I'll simply close by pointing out one issue that I think hasn't changed that I think is a, is a big problem. And, and I'm speaking from a US government perspective here, but you know, I think the, the federal government's uh, inability to, to uh, hire new employees in a timely manner uh, and, and bring in new talent uh, really creates a bottleneck in the pipeline. Um, I think this is a, an obstacle to building a more diverse and talented workforce, both in nuclear policy and, and, and in, in national security. And certainly individual managers and, and senior officials find ways to bring people in and it does have a big impact. But I don't think we're hiring on a scale that is proportionate to the, the national security problems we face. And I, I think uh, this limitation makes the nuclear policy field uh, less competitive when it comes to attracting uh, graduating students and young professionals. I think there's also a, a challenge of, of uh, self-selection in, in nuclear policy and national security. So I'm happy to, to discuss that further during the, the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you. And Sarah? Thank you so much, uh, Jessica. And thank you to CNA for convening this important panel. I'm so delighted to be here, although I have the unenviable job of trying to come after um, some excellent, excellent panelists. So I think I'm probably going to be repeating some of what you've already heard. but. I did just want to offer a couple of quick sort of observations about how I believe the field of nuclear policy has changed in terms of diversity over the last you know, five or 10 years. And I'll end with a couple of, of food for thought questions that maybe will lead us into our conversation. So in terms of sort of the composition of the field, we've heard a lot about some of the good indicators that are out there that things appear to be moving in a positive direction. Jessica, I know you mentioned in your introduction that the Biden administration has one of the most diverse cabinets in history. Um, as somebody who focuses in particular on gender issues, I think Unidir has really done some excellent research to understand how the disarmament diplomacy space is changing in terms of its composition. And it is clear that the proportion of women who are working in that sector has increased over the kind of long durée, you know, last four decades or so. But we also know from a lot of these statistics and data that um, many of these groups remain underrepresented in our field and we have a long way to go. So Sylvia, as, as you kind of said, we're we're at an inflection point here and I agree with that. Um, second though, and, and not surprisingly based on what I've just said, I think it's clear that more attention is being given to the question of diversity, equity and inclusivity in our field and that the space is becoming more crowded. People don't always uh, mean that as a positive, but I absolutely do. I think you know we're lucky to have these many different groups who are working to increase diversity from different sectors. You know, that might mean national governments who are looking at ways to implement a feminist foreign policy, for example, um, some of the tremendous organizations that Jessica mentioned again in her introduction, you know, WCAPs, Gender Champions, uh, my own effort, the CNS Young Women in Nonproliferation Initiative. And when I think about what the impact of those programs are, I think of them as being, you know, both kind of structural and normative. So First, they're creating these pipelines for individuals who have traditionally been excluded from this discussion or underrepresented in the nuclear policy debate to enter the field and find ways to remain there. But second, and I think equally important, they're putting pressure on other organizations within the field to either develop their own similar parallel initiatives that address their target audiences or to support those that already exist. And in my view, we need both of those kinds of pressures, both of those kinds of outcomes. 
And then third and, and closely related, I think, as we've heard already on our panel this morning, the discussion around what we mean when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusivity in this space has become more nuanced and more sophisticated. So when I think back to some of the gender-focused conversations that I was part of, you know, maybe five or seven years ago, I remember the primary focus being really on quantifying um, how many women are at an event, how many women are in a room, how many women work at a given organization, and, and how can we kind of get this to parity? And of course, those are important questions because we need those metrics to measure our progress. But to echo what I think you know, both Alex and, and Vince have said, in general, more people in our field are sort of cognizant and becoming more cognizant of the intersectionality of these different identities in the nuclear space. And they're thinking about ways to address some of the systemic barriers that, that pertain to and limit certain groups from engaging in these conversations in a way that I, I think is more sophisticated. Um, these are to me positive changes, but they leave me with two big questions and that's how I'll kind of close my introductory remarks. The first of these is, you know, what will the impacts of these efforts be on our field in the long term? Are we focusing on all parts of the so-called career pipeline? And, and do we understand enough about where the leaks in that pipeline are to be able to plug them effectively? That's the that's question for me because we're at the beginning of a journey here. And second and not unrelated, you know, which of these challenges, issues, and approaches are, are unique to the nuclear policy field? And since we know that not all of them are unique, what strategies can we borrow from other fields like STEM that have, I think, been successful at increasing the diversity in their field, although not wholly? So can we borrow some of those, learn from our um, sort of adjacent colleagues and groups and try to apply, apply some of that to our own work? Um, so those are things that I know I'm thinking about in my own work. I know that I am not unusual in that regard, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing um, our discussion and our Q&A, and I'll hand it back over to Jessica. Thanks. Thank you all for those wonderful opening remarks. A lot to think about there and a really good um, background information. So we'll have a bit of discussion next, but listeners, please start submitting your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, so to really start this conversation, Vince, thank you for giving that background and kind of where have we moved from in the past 10 years? Where are we at now? Um, and so just some questions I have for all of you. Um, as Alex mentioned in the New America report, mentions this idea that you have to be, you have, to have 20 to 25 years of experience, even raise your hand in a room to be considered an expert. You have to have these, you know, these different ideas um, of what makes an expert. And so I'd be curious in your own um, experience and in your colleagues' experience that you know, what barriers have you experienced throughout your career? I don't know if anyone wants to kick that one off. Well, I can say um, I, I don't. I don't want to speak for myself specifically, but I think a, a general um, thing that I've seen maybe amongst colleagues and peers is is exactly this issue that you point to of who who is an expert and what constitutes expertise. Um, and a, a lot of times, you know, if you're, you're reading an article and seeing quotes from experts or, or seeing talking heads on TV and that kind of thing. Um, I think increasingly, it, it, speaking to the, this question of what has changed, I think there is a movement towards understanding that, you know, women also know, people of color also know about these issues, that, you know, um, and, and you see kind of producers and folks making more of an effort to bring in more diverse perspectives and views. But I think um, especially, so that, that has started to change, I think for the better, I hope for the better. But I think historically that question of, um, Kind of who is an expert and and not just how many years have you been working in the field but like if you are it, it, there are you know perceptions about whether you know for example a younger man is an expert versus versus a woman um or or, or that kind of thing so yeah thinking about what an expert actually looks like and and sounds like yeah i i'm happy to weigh in there too and and alex's comments kind of sparked something for me and thinking about the interactions that I have with undergraduate women in particular who are thinking about entering this field. Um, and I think one of the, the things when I reflect back on my own experience too that is challenging is 
figuring out how to bring your kind of authentic voice, authentic interests, authentic expertise to the nuclear policy space while recognizing that you do need to you know, understand certain kinds of a vocabulary, understand ways to speak in a certain way in order to be part of that conversation. Of course, that's not new. That's, you know, what Carol Cohn was writing about in, in 1987. But those, I think, issues remain particularly salient. And it's hard for people who have not had a lot of experience in the field to, to figure out that balance and figure out how to bring their, their own selves to, to the discussion in ways that are really important for the outcomes in our space, while still figuring out how to have a seat at the table and how to be a part of, of, of that discussion. And that's something I don't think we have um, kind of come to any kind of conclusion about. We're still figuring out how to navigate those, those tensions there. Thanks. Uh, Sylvia Vince, would either of you like to weigh in? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Jessica. Um, I, I think one of the uh, barriers in this field also, because it is such a niche uh, field, it's also the lack of visible career pathways. Uh, often uh, a lot of young uh, folks uh, who I uh, mentor and who, with whom I engage in conversations, they're not often acquainted with what are some of the career trajectories uh, that are uh, that is possible in this field. Um, and therefore, I think it's extremely important to underscore also the achievements and the possible career trajectories that this field offers. The lack of uh, visible and uh, the lack of visible role models is an important detriment for younger people. So it is important to spotlight the work of women scholars who are doing important work advancing uh, this uh, field in organizations. I think organizations have an important responsibility to amplify and show and share the spotlight on the work that their uh, women scholars are doing in this extremely uh, niche field. And uh, again, I, I think I want to uh, double down on what Alex said about this citation bias that exists in this field. Uh, overall, the international security uh, field is often uh, replete with repetitions of uh, getting the same people on television, getting the same quotes from uh, those uh, familiar names. And um, Alex Bell and Kelsey Davenport uh, wrote a fantastic article on Martical about this, about how we need to take deliberate steps to undermine uh, quoting the same uh, people, the same uh, community of experts. and it is important for us to take intentional steps uh, to diversify and get quotation because um, it is important for younger scholars and people to see uh, views and perspectives of uh, women scholars, their role models being reflected in popular uh, media. I'll stop there. So, I mean, the only thing I would add is I, I think it is very important that we, we sort of take a wider view of, of uh, who is an expert, uh, you know, what kind of valuable experience and, and particularly uh, what disciplines um, are relevant to helping us reduce nuclear dangers. I think that's, that's very important. Um, and at the same time, as, as uh, Sarah said, I think there are some fundamentals that, that you need to, uh, need to kind of master in, in order to formulate, uh, formulate uh, sound views on policy and, and, and where policy needs to change or where it doesn't need to change. Uh, and for other other colleagues in your in the field to take you take you seriously and pay attention to what uh, what you have to say, um, jargon. I think it, you know sometimes jargon, in my view, is an obstacle to discussion because people are just kind of throwing out words without explaining what what they mean. Um, same time, I think you know sometimes when jargon reflects some common concept, it, it's kind of shorthand that that. Uh, people use to interact with each other and specialists in particular use to interact with each other. And there's, there's kind of no getting around that. So I, I mean, it, it is a balance that we need to strike. And that's why I think um, have, having mentors and having programs kind of committed to, to bringing together uh, people of, of various stages in their career um, where, where they can interact and get to know each other and, and have that kind of dialogue is, is, is very important. Um, and I, and I do think, you know, for some things, it does take some time. To, to build expertise, it's not something that can happen in a year or two. It does take uh, it does take upwards of, of years or decades on, on some issues that that where you're 
synthesizing uh, technical, political, diplomatic, operational issues, um, stuff like that. You know, for, for most people, there you know there are people who, brilliant, who are brilliant and can do it very quickly. But for a lot of people, it takes it does take some time. So I, I you know, um, in, in my view, it's it's really kind of creating a, an environment where people um, are able to learn um, and have their views taken seriously and, and sort of have that interaction that 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 does kind of build uh, genuine expertise. I think. One idea that I think really came through in everybody's remarks just there, and I've been to mention this earlier as well, is this issue of self-selection. Um, all these job applications, all of the uh, things they say you need 20 years of experience or 10 years of experience with this, plus a master's degree, plus five other things in language skills, and we're going to pay you $50,000. Um, and that's just one example, not any organization in particular. Um, so how do we kind of get over this idea of the self-selection bias? So we're not expert enough to write this article or we shouldn't put our hat in the ring um, for speaking on this television. So how do you, what is your advice for people or how do we get past that and really get rid of this self-selection issue and hopefully increase diversity? I'm, I'm happy to, to take a stab here. I mean, this I think this harkens back to something that we've already kind of touched upon and, and I think Vince mentioned as well that you know, sort of helping people expand their understanding of the fields and disciplines that are relevant to our space is really important to changing how people self-select into the field. I mean, if you're an anthropology student um, who's thinking, you know, nothing I'm interested in has any relevance to the space at all, you know, that's not true. And helping people have a better understanding as they're thinking about potential career paths about how do my skills and interests apply to this space, I think is a really important part of, of changing that calculus. I'm, I'm not sure in any field we're ever going to do away with self-selection. And I think self-selection is important. It, it means you're passionate about the subject and you wanna dedicate your life to that. Um, but I think helping people take a broader view of, oh yeah, here is where my particular interests are going to advance the issues that this field is working on. It's not just for, you know, people who have an IR background or, a, or a, you know, foreign policy background, even though those are incredibly important, there are these other toeholds as well, and I can self-select into that kind of work. So that's, that's one approach I think we might take. So one, I mean, one thing I've been thinking about is, is how do you uh, kind of engage with, with uh, people when they're maybe in middle school or high school to really sort of introduce them into the, the field of, of nuclear policy, I mean, maybe even international security more broadly, maybe it's not just nuclear policy, because nuclear policy is, I mean, it always is going to be kind of a niche field, right? I think it, it um, we want to bring more people into it, but but, but I think uh, the broader study of international security and and, and public service uh, and, and civil society, I think is, is very valuable. And, I, you know, I, I don't know if maybe there's some way to, I was always thinking of, of if you could have a program to sort of identify people at the right age and, and, and let them come shadow folks in the US government, for instance, but other organizations as well uh, that are working in the space, let them shadow them for a week or two, that might be useful or potentially have folks who are in the field uh, go to high schools or, or middle schools. And I know some, I know there, there has been some, some folks who have done work in, in, in that area, but trying to, to sort of broaden that effort so that it, it's, not, it's, um, you know, schools across the country in the United States are, are having practitioners come and scholars come sort of talk about, these are the issues I work on. These are the wide range of, of, of disciplines and topics of study that are, are relevant to it, just to kind of give kids a sense of uh, what the possibilities are. I think that may be, may be some way to, uh, to, to widen the door a little bit at the sort of below, it's even below the entry level job, but, but at the, at the um, sort of educational level. Um, totally agree with with all of the above. And just to add add to that, I think it's also important to think about getting around the question of, of self-selection. So, um, you know, if for a hiring manager, for example, or for a journalist who's writing a piece where they're quoting experts, um, to see it as incumbent on them to step outside their kind of traditional networks or, or people they might know of. And, um, you know, for example, reach out to WCAPS and post a job on their, their awesome uh, jobs board <laughs> so that 
you know, you're not just circulating a, a job to, you know, your own networks, where which might be more people who look like you or people who went to the same school as you, which is like, you know, I, I've, I've done that before, everyone's done it before, but um, to, to reach a new audience of folks who, who might want to opt into to hiring or who you might want to um, quote in an article. Uh, if I just uh, may uh, quickly, I really appreciate uh, Vin, Sarah, and Alex's remark uh, on this. I think uh, all the three really uh, laid out well on what are some of the initiatives that can take place on a more broader uh, plane. But I feel uh, that one of the mitigation strategies against this self-selection, and when it comes to the at the core of the individual, is essentially about fighting the imposter syndrome, right, within uh, oneself. And um, and I feel that it is important for us, and especially in this field, to have those safe spaces, which really, un, like, which really bolsters our our self confidence, our ability uh, to uh, think beyond some of the immediate challenges that we think we are facing, and this idea of creating uh, safe spaces. I think uh, some organizations are doing an incredible uh, job of uh, handholding younger professionals in the field to overcome uh, the imposter syndrome, which is, which is real. Uh, we, we all know it, we all have been uh, there. In 2020, uh, Sarah Kuchis Fahani from uh, N Square did an amazing report called Greater Than Reimagining the Nuclear Policy Field. And over there, uh, like the report underscores the importance of not just uh, vertical networking, but also horizontal networking, which means you build a community of peers who are there to uh, support you, engage you, and like have that sp safe space for you to uh, bolster your self-confidence, uh, to bolster your faith in your ability so that at an individual level, you do not self-select yourself out. Thank you all for those great remarks. Definitely um, agree with all of that. There is definitely um, things that we can be doing to help with this. And it's also very much on a personal level as well. Um, and so one of the questions in the Q&A um, is asking more about the impacts of this diversity. So um, it says, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on how diversity impacts decision-making and discussion of nuclear policy. Any examples you can point to where del uh, deliberations are impacted by diversity. Um, so have you firsthand witnessed, you know, um, the benefits of this? I'll throw the questions so you guys can all see it. I mean, the example that comes to my mind is you know the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and the negotiation of, of the TPNW where you did have a more diverse group of delegates who were in the room, at least based on who was registered. And then as a result, you have in the treaty a reference to you know the importance of understanding the differentiated impacts of nuclear use or the development of nuclear weapons, things like that. So I do think, um, you know, obviously it's very, very challenging to draw causal inferences about who was part of the conversation and what is the actual outcome in, in terms of kind of treaty text, because those are negotiated documents. But um, to me, that I think is one instance where it does appear that, that there was at least some relationship between who was part of the conversation and what the actual outcome of that conversation was. So that's, that's one that I think about. But I think, you know, just kind of more broadly, as Alex alluded to in her introduction, we do have these... Um, instinct about how this should matter. So we have information from, um, you know, sort of the private sector pointing to, to the ways that diversity changes the bottom line for organizations that are paying attention to things like that. Um, we also have information from, you know, um, sort of the scientific and, and peer review space that tells us that diverse author groups tend to be, generate more highly cited papers than, than uh, sort of homogenous or homogeneous um, author groups. And I think we can make some guesses as to why that is true, some of which are backed up by, by actual um, research that include things like, you know, when you are working with um, people who do not look like you or do not, you know, sound like you or do not share the same ideas that you do necessarily, you articulate your positions more clearly because you are prepared to have to defend them um, from people who you can't necessarily assume will agree with you. 
And that does lead to better outcomes in our space because it leads to more rigorous discussion and, and debate. Um, but I, I think that's a really important question that, that this, um, this questioner is asking is, you know, what can we point to in particular? Because particularly if we're trying to emphasize to groups or individuals who are not necessarily sold on, on the importance of increasing diversity in our field, it is really useful to have those kinds of data points. And I personally would like to have more of them. And I hope we can do some research in our field to, to kind of pinpoint those and drill down on them. So and one thought I had is just my experiences in the government. When you're in, working in a government office, you're, I mean, you're part of a team, right? You're, you're super busy. Sometimes you're doing policy development. A lot of times you're doing policy implementation. And in order to just get the job done, you do kind of have to develop sort of a, sort of a mind meld with your, your coworkers. And that's, you know, again, that's sort of what you need to do in order to uh, implement the, the, whatever particular policy is in place. On the other hand, I mean, I think that does lend itself to groupthink, and that's where I think it, it is very important to sort of have, um, be bringing in a fresh set of eyes and perspectives into a, any given office uh, so that you have folks coming in who, who um, aren't necessarily kind of part of that mind meld, who can, can question it, can sort of raise, raise questions about uh, assumptions and first principles, and, and it's sort of having that, that, that interaction and that back and forth is, is very healthy. And, and again, there are times where there are times where you question the policy and times where institutionally and you might change it, times where that's, that's not what's going to happen. But I think just in, in terms of, of overall uh, uh, people approaching the issues in a, in a constructive, healthy way, having sort of uh, that mix is important. And it's something that I, I just don't think happens if you can't, um, can't bring in new people into, a, into an organization. So it's, so it's a big challenge um, when that's not happening. Another example that comes to mind is a story um, that we told in the consensual straight jacket report around um, th that we heard from the perspective of a few of different women that we interviewed. So it was kind of kept coming up as an example of um, getting how to get the policy problem of how to get chemical weapons out of Syria and the solution that they um, actually ended up using it when it first came up was seen as this kind of like out of left field idea that no one had really tried before and seemed kind of kind of wild, um, but that it was picked up and championed um, in these conversations by women in particular um, who kind of pushed that idea forward and eventually um, that was the idea that was implemented. Great, and I think, oh, Sylvia, sorry. Uh, just quickly, I, I think, um, a lot of great points were shared, but one uh, thing that I feel that uh, the nuclear policy field is also facing a bit of stagnancy and stasis is the reason also why we are not able to, uh, and I think Vince mentioned this uh, earlier in his opening remarks about the importance of the federal government being able to hire a diverse and new talent uh, quickly. Nuclear policy issues, a lot of them are also interrelated. And the fact uh, that there are still nine nuclear armed countries in the world and the process of disarmament or non-proliferation, a lot of these countries tend to look at the other countries uh, in terms of uh, holding on to norms or taboos or, in, or, or also in terms of signature and treaty ratification, for example, the CTBT. Therefore, I think when it comes to uh, tackling some of these very complex nuclear uh, challenges, it is also important to get uh, folks not only from diverse background, but also diverse uh, regional uh, backgrounds, which are, and who are able to offer a unique regional perspective because uh, not always, uh, for example, uh, Americans are able to uh, look into or like talk and see through issues, for example, what's happening in Southern Asia with the uh, ongoing crisis in Afghanistan. So it's important to incorporate regional and unique perspectives and uh, views, uh, which I think is lacking and better facilitating incorporating these views is something that all organizations and spe specifically academic institutions uh, should uh, think uh, through as in how we try to uh, give uh, and like reinvigorate uh, nuclear policy decision-making processes. 
Absolutely. And so with the fi last five minutes, I have one last question. Thank you to all the audience members for submitting your questions. I apologize we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but we've kind of raised some good things, some challenging things in the field. And so what is being done to ensure um, the strides that have been made will continue on in the future? So they're not just going to die if a new administration comes in, if people have different beliefs. How do we ensure that we have this constant diversity, that we have, we're bringing in people with new ideas? Um, either on a very tangible level, like what policies are being implemented or on this broad level, how do we keep this fight going? I don't have uh, a good answer, but I think that's a great question and, and a critical question to be asking. I was just reflecting on, um, I, I did a presentation a few years ago using some of the, the data from the consensual straitjacket report. And I think it was actually that Unidir data specifically looking at the proportion of women in, in delegations um, to various con international conferences and kind of shows how it's like ticking up uh, slowly but surely percentage wise. Um, and someone in the audience was like, well, if this is, you know, if it's changing and things are getting better, then why do you care about this so much? Like, it just sort of seems like it's on this natural trajectory. <laughs> um, and I think that that really kind of obscures and, and covers up all of the really hard work that it's taken to, to get um, to this place and, or, you know, to improve the things. And um, I, I, the past few years have certainly shown that that diversity backsliding is is possible and and that these um, norms and values haven't really been institutionalized uh, enough yet so that we can in, ensure that we'll be able to retain um, retain the gains that we make even moving forward. So I think that's that's a really important question. To continue uh, this fight, I think uh, it is important to be both deliberate and intentional about bringing these uh, specific uh, changes. I had the good opportunity to uh, write and co-author with Sarah on uh, how to be deliberate about breaking this uh, current stasis in the nuclear policy uh, field. And we do uh, lay out a couple of approaches of uh, how to get around this issue. But I, I think we are also talking about not only just the United States, but the United States has a special responsibility and place in the global uh, nuclear policy field to carry forward these conversation with the immense soft power also that the US uh, wields. It is important for the United States at important uh, multilateral organizations and venues to advance these conversation and therefore working and partnering and handholding with the nonprofits, which also play an important role, the NGOs, the academic uh, bastions, and multilateral organizations, the US has a special role in seeing that it's not just a conversation that is local, but also it's global, and, and the U US has a special role in advancing uh, and making sure that DEI remains uh, at the front and center in not only just the United States, but also uh, globally. I'll stop there. I can add on a little um, to the excellent comments of both Alex and, and, and Sylvia. Um, you know, I think one of the things that that is really important is to start to integrate diversity into the programming that our various organizations do. So rather than having diversity, equity and inclusivity be kind of its own thing, which is really important, thinking about ways to, to build you know, gender mainstreaming or what have you into the various projects that you're running so that it is an integrated part of the work that you're doing on a sort of intrinsic level, I think that's going to be important to sustaining momentum around this issue in our space. Um, but I think at the same time, you know, one of the things, Alex, I agree with you that the, the norm hasn't been sort of institutionalized or made robust enough as it is, and we, we can't rest until that happens. But I do think that, you know, speaking from my own personal perspective, my barometer for what looks normal and what looks abnormal has changed a lot as a result of the hard work that people in our field are doing. So if I see a panel that includes you know, only older white men, it looks really strange to me. And, and I'm not sure I could have said that 10 years ago. It, you know, I was working in a different field, but I'm not sure that that was true. And um, so I'm happy to say that you know, I think there is kind of a um, changing just yeah, barometer or, or measuring stick for, for what 
is okay and what is not okay. And I hope that we can continue to reinforce that at the same time that we're making these important structural and institutional changes um, within our sector. All right, and so thank you all so much. We have one last minute. Vince, you wanna chime in one last minute and then I'm gonna close it up. Just one, one final thought on your question. I agree with uh, the comments of my fellow, fellow uh, panelists. I, I think, I mean, certainly for me, um, you know, the conversations that, that, like this that we've been having over the past few years have really uh, helped me appreciate that we kind of the individual responsibility we all have, especially those of us that are are now kind of mid-career um, for, for trying to uh, find ways to, to help younger colleagues um, mm -hmm feel comfortable, sort of get over the, uh, I think the imposter syndrome is, is uh, uh, what, what Sylvia mentioned and, and, and sort of help, help people uh, sort of have the opportunity and the comfort level uh, and confidence to, to sort of tackle the, the, the learning curve that's always gonna exist in a, a complex field like this. So I think that's, that's something that I think uh, we all individually can do kind of regardless of um, uh, you know, who's in office, right? Thanks. Thank you all um, for sharing your thoughts on the future of the nuclear policy field and kind of how we can keep this fight going. Um, thank you everyone for joining today and your excellent questions and comments. Um, I hope we can all stay in touch on this important topic. I put in this I put this in the chat, but I'd like to invite you to see today's next discussion, reassessing the refugee migration crisis in Europe, European Union policy strategy and response at September 21st at 11 a.m. My colleague Analia Westerhog will be moderating this timely discussion. Um, and once again, thank you all panelists and attendees for joining. Um, I really appreciate your time this morning.